Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Oliferis. I'm the Executive Director for the Contra Costa Taxpayers Association. Uh, the Contra Costa Taxpayers Association is this over a 75 year plus nonprofit, nonpartisan, membership driven organization dedicated to promoting accountable, cost effective, and efficient government and opposing unnecessary taxes and spending within cities and county and districts within Contra Costa County. To, to new attendees, please join our organization. If you're not a member, we have brochures. It's, uh, it's a small cost, but a vibrant taxpayers group is key, the key to keeping uh, an efficient and accountable government in Contra Costa County. And thank you for attending today's important luncheon event with San Jose Mayor, Chuck Reed, he's been in the news, and you've, you've probably read him in the newspaper. But before I do that, I'd like to introduce Vallejo ex-council member, Stephanie Gomes. Because Vallejo is one example of how they faced a first bankruptcy, and now the news is announcing they're facing a second round of bankruptcy due to spiraling pension costs. So I'd like to introduce Stephanie Gomes, ex Vallejo council member, to the podium. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. I don't know if I would call it ex council member, although they did try to recall me once, um, unsuccessfully. Um, I just turned out in, in um, January after serving two terms. I'm one of only two council members who was in Vallejo before, during, and after bankruptcy. We were the first. We went bankrupt in uh, 2008. And I came and spoke before y'all a couple years ago um, about our, our experience there and some of the errors that we made. But what I want to just mention today, because um, our main speaker, Mayor Reed, is, is going to tell the, the big story. Vallejo is, is just an illustration of, of why I wanted to join with Mayor Reed and, and what he's trying to do in terms of pension reform. You know, Moody's um, just came out with a report recently that said that Vallejo's financial problems are largely due to our, our, our pension costs that we did not reduce during bankruptcy. And, and in, in a sense, you know, they're trying to kind of blame Vallejo for not reducing our pensions in bankruptcy, but I have to say, having been there, um, we're a small city, a blue collar town, we were bankrupt, and we were being threatened by CalPERS that if we cut pensions, that we would be in a very long and very expensive battle, legal battle, and we simply couldn't afford that. We simply could not afford to do that. And we figured, well, we knew, because we know the pension problem, that there would be bigger cities coming along behind us that would be going into bankruptcy, that would have the money to fight that battle. But I think the big thing for me is that, you know, for Vallejo, they, Penn Moody said that we're headed for a second bankruptcy. I'm not sure if we are or not, but we know that pensions are going to exceed 70% of payroll in six years in Vallejo and 30% of our budget in five years. And, and it's, it's scary. It's scary for me having been through it and um, as, as somebody who had to make some pretty tough decisions and, and having not wanting my city to go through that again, for sure. And so we need to fix this. We need to fix it and, and what I realized in our bankruptcy is that cities can't fix it on their own. It's, um, it's got to be a big, a broader effort. We have to join together um, to do that. And it doesn't, it shouldn't have to come down to a legal battle between cities and CalPERS that, you know, we should be able to fix this with reform that would give cities the, the tools to reduce pensions and to make, to give us the ability to have sustainable budgets. And really that's what it's all about. As was mentioned before, what we have now, it's not sustainable. And, and I think it was Joe Nation who said that, the, uh, that pensions are a virus making its way through municipal government. And really that's what it is. And, and, and it's going to continue to be a virus unless we're able to um, give us the tools to, to fix the problem. So with that, I know you're not here to listen to me. I am extremely honored um, to introduce um, our main speaker, uh, Mayor Chuck Reed. He has worked really hard. You see him, like you said, in a lot of interviews all over the television. 
He's putting his time and his passion into this, and he's helping the rest of us, which, for which I'm very grateful. So I'm honored to introduce Mayor Chuck Reed. Thank you, and I want to thank uh, Stephanie for the introduction, but more importantly for joining with me and other mayors as proponents of the statewide ballot initiative. And I just want to underline something that Stephanie said about Vallejo's experience in bankruptcy and, and the cost of taking on the pension issue. One of the other proponents of uh, the statewide ballot initiative is Bill Camp, mayor of Pacific Grove. They're now on their third ballot initiative of Pacific Grove. And Bill told me uh, last week when I talked to him that they had spent $600,000 defending their various ballot initiatives and doing that. And I don't know what cost Stephanie in Vallejo was facing, but in San Jose, to engineer our ballot initiative, design it, negotiate it, and then defend it has cost us to date $3 million. That's the bad news. The good news is we've saved $20 million this year. But how many cities in the state of California can afford $3 million to do something? Very few. And that's part of the reason that Stephanie and I have taken up this statewide ballot initiative, because we know that the cities need to do things, but the mayors don't have the tools. And so the statewide initiative, which I will come back to in a minute, uh, is an important tool uh, for mayors and cities across the state. When I talk, and I have talked to all over the country, to conferences, I've been interviewed by lots and lots of media, and uh, it, it's always interesting why they're interested in the San Jose experience. So I do have to explain a little bit about the San Jose experience, which is why people found it startling that a couple of years ago, we put a ballot measure in front of our voters, and they voted 70% yes uh, to make changes in our pension benefits for future employees and current employees. San Jose is a big city, the 10th largest city in the country, the third largest in California. Uh, we're the capital of Silicon Valley, the innovation center of the world. We have general obligation bond ratings of AA plus and AA1. Uh, the last couple of years, we have led the country in job growth and the rate of job growth. We have two independent retirement plans. One of them, uh, the federated plan, has achieved an investment return in excess of 7.5% since its inception. The other one, our police and fire plan, has returned investment returns in excess of 8% since its inception. So with that background, why would a Democratic mayor in a Democratic city with 10, nine out of 10 council members being Democrats in a heavily Democratic state, choose to take on the local unions, the state unions, and the national unions over pension reform. And the fact that we did has startled a lot of people. And the short answer to that is that the cost of doing nothing, the pain of doing nothing was far greater than the pain of taking on the fight. And Stephanie talked about how much of their budget was going into retirement costs and how much they're paying. At some point, as a mayor, you realize that your job is to provide services to your residents and taxpayers, and you are going to be incapable of doing your job unless you take on this issue. And that's true in city after city across the state. In San Jose, we had a decade of doing the usual. Business as usual meant cutting services to balance the budget. Skyrocketing retirement costs drove our costs up for a decade, still are for that matter. During the decade preceding us taking action, the decade of pain, we had a, about a 20% increase in revenues. Not bad, you know, not good, nothing to brag about, but a 20% increase in revenues. But costs went up by 85%. And we covered that problem, we dealt with that problem by cutting services. We cut 2,000 jobs out of our workforce. Went from 7,400 workers to 5,400 workers. Every department took a hit. There was no part of the city that didn't suffer from cuts in services. The cost 
behind that retirement costs went from $73 million to $245 million per year during that time period, taking money right out of services. And the best example that I use is our police department. Now, unless the fire chief is in the room, and I don't see him here, the police department is the number one department. And I think that's true in every city across the state that everybody would agree police is a core service, right? We talk about what's core service and what isn't. Police department is a core service, I think. Nobody argues with that. So it's our most important department. During that decade when we were cutting services, we increased the budget for the police department by nearly $100 million. And yet we had less police officers at the end of the decade working for the city than we had at the beginning of the decade because costs went up the costs swallowed the budget increases. And so we end up with less officers. And that's also true in the fire department and it's worse in the other departments. The other element that I have to talk about a little bit is California. Because we tell the San Jose story and people say, well, you know, well, you're just an outlier. It's an exception, you know, it's not gonna happen. You don't have to worry about it. It's imaginary, you've, you've heard that. San Jose is not an outlier. Yeah, we are at the leading edge, Vallejo was at the bleeding edge. We're at the leading edge of dealing with the problem, but we're not an outlier because you take that same decade and look at how much the taxpayers, this is a taxpayers association, right? How much the taxpayers put into retirement costs, retirement plans across the state during the decade. We went from $3.4 billion a year to $17.4 billion a year. That's money that you put in. Now that includes the local plans, the state plans, the county plans, all the plans. And those are not my numbers. I don't work on my numbers because I work on the state controller's numbers or the retirement board numbers. So those are the numbers the state controller put together based on the financial reports filed by the retirement organizations. Those, those are just California's numbers. That rate of growth is worse than the rate of growth in San Jose. So we know it's uh, happening all over the state, expressed in many different ways, but it is a huge problem for the state of California. Now, of course, that happened after the infamous SB 400 bill was passed by the state legislature, which granted retroactive benefit increases, big ones, and eventually trickled down and affected every jurisdiction in the state. And when SB 400 was passed, CalPERS said that all of this could be done without costing the taxpayers a dime. Now, you know, that was technically correct. It didn't cost you a dime. It cost you $17 billion. But that was the mentality in 1999. And we are in deep trouble because of that and other decisions that have driven up the cost. The governor pointed out in his most recent budget that the total unfunded liabilities for the state is $218 billion. CalPERS has informed the other agencies, and I think Vallejo is a CalPERS agency, that they're going to have to pay an increase, an increase in costs of 50% over the next six years. CalSTRS, so these are their numbers, CalSTRS has said they need somewhere between four and five billion dollars a year of additional funding to cover the gap at CalSTRS, a teacher's retirement plan. Those are their numbers. And those are the optimistic scenario because those numbers are all based on the assumption that the plans will continue to invert, earn re investment returns of seven and a half percent per year, per year, per year, for 30 years. I think that's optimistic. And they even agree that it's optimistic because they, they note that it's less than a 50-50 probability of occurring. Well, that's optimistic, I think. So that's the optimistic scenario. So that's kind of setting the stage for California. And then I want to share a little bit with you about what we learned in San Jose with, with our experience. And our experience in San Jose was driven by two things that we were trying to do at the same time, which is to make sure our employees get paid what they've earned. But at the same time, provide reasonable services that our residents and our taxpayers deserve. Now, either one of those goals by itself would be relatively straightforward and simple. But doing both at the same time is what makes it hard and what makes it complicated. But that is what we were trying to do in San Jose, and I think those are the goals that we should strive for in the state of California as well. What I figured out, and I, 
I'm not an actuary, I'm not a CPA, I'm a lawyer by training, I never had to deal with this issue, it never came up on the campaign trail, the pension reform was never mentioned the whole time I was running for office the, the first time. So I've learned all this on the job, and the thing that I have learned was the central problem in all of this is that the benefits are too expensive. That we, the government, cannot afford to pay the true full costs of the benefits, and our employees cannot afford to pay the full true cost of the benefits. And that's what has driven everybody's efforts to kick the can down the road, to push it into the future, because we can't afford it. It's just too expensive. The other thing I learned, much to my dismay, was that you can't reduce the costs with changes in assumptions. I thought I had it all figured out. You know, you just change that assumption here and assumption there, and hey, suddenly you're fully funded. It doesn't work that way. The benefits cost what the benefits cost. You made a promise, you got a contract, when somebody retires, you gotta pay them in real dollars. And it doesn't matter what you thought you would earn on your investments or how long you thought they might live. The benefits cost what they cost and they are just too expensive. And what you have to do is focus on reducing the cost. But all the actuarial assumption stuff does not, doesn't reduce the cost. It may shift the cost to future generations or in other ways, but it does not reduce the cost. And the only way to significantly affect the cost is to deal with current employees, because that's where the big numbers are. The liabilities that we're looking at have already been incurred for current retirees and current employees. It's not the future employees. Now, dealing with future employees is important. But we have to live in the short run, we have to pay the bills in the short run, and current employees is where we are spending the money. And yes, do something for future employees, but you have to take on current employees, and that's what we did in San Jose. Uh, the other thing I learned was the sooner you start dealing with the problem, the better off you are and the easier it is to solve the problem. But the sooner you start dealing with the problem, the harder it is to convince people you need to deal with the problem. So the, the trick for us leaders is to figure out what the best timing is to do something. Because if you wait too long, you get so far down the road that when something bad happens, you've lost your options and bankruptcy becomes really the only option. But if you start early, people won't listen to you. So taxpayers have a really important role in this thing to getting people to a point where they're willing to deal with the problem. But the sooner you start, but for sure, the better off you are. And if you wait too long, the choices are really ugly. In San Jose, we put in front of our voters a ballot measure to change things for our new employees, uh, certainly. Uh, a defined benefit plan. Yes, we decided we would keep defined benefit plans. I know there's a tremendous uh, argument over whether or not defined benefit or defined contribution. We decided that defined benefits uh, was something that we wanted to preserve. But to do that, we had to shift some of the risk. That the taxpayers cannot take all the risk of a defined benefit plan. It's too risky, too dangerous. So in our new employee defined benefit plan, the employees share 50% of the risk. Whether it's normal cost, or future cost, or past cost, or unfunded, it doesn't matter. 50-50. So the employees have an equal share with the government in controlling those costs and having truth and honesty in the calculation of the cost because ultimately the employees have to have to share them. So that's a big shift for our new employees. But as I said, that doesn't solve the problem because that's new employees. For our current employees, we decided that given the constraints of California law, all we could do was either lay them off, cut their pay, or make them pay more. That was a narrow range of things that we could do. Well, we did that whole lay them off thing. We cut a lot of jobs, we did that. And we cut their pay. So with our ballot initiative, we decided that our employees would have to pay more to help pay for unfunded liabilities. And we set it up, either they have to pay more to cover the unfunded liabilities, or they have to take a pay cut to help with the unfunded liabilities. And that is a lot more, 16% of pay more towards unfunded liabilities, or 16% pay cut towards unfunded liabilities. Even with that, they won't pay for half of the cost. The employees are already paying 20%, roughly 16 to 20% of pay right today for retirement costs. That's pension and healthcare. 
Another 16% on top of that will not be half of the cost. Now, that's a heavy burden for our employees. We recognize that because, as I said before, they can't afford to pay the full true cost. So we also gave our employees a choice of dropping down to a lower cost benefit plan that looks a lot like the plan that we adopted for our new employees. So they have a choice. Those who are closer to retirement probably stick with the old plan, the old benefits, and pay the old cost. Uh, the, new, the people who chose to come to a lower cost plan would keep what they've already earned and then accrue it at different rates and stretch out the retirement age. That was the employee choice provision. We got a 70% yes vote for that from the people of San Jose in a heavily democratic city that was supported by liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, independents, 70% yes vote. So that was a great success. Now what's our current status after having done that? Well first, we're still paying over 20% of our general fund into retirement costs. In fact, the cost, payroll costs for public safety employees for pension and retiree health care costs is not 70% of payroll, that looks cheap. We're at 82% of payroll for public safety for the current employees. The new employees are at 22%, huge shield. For our federated employees, we're at 71% of payroll and 21% for the new employees and, and federated. So we are still climbing. But we did save over $20 million this year, uh, which helps. We balanced the budget with uh, the help of that $20 million, and we're beginning to see significant increases. We're now in the multi-million dollar range of savings from the new employees as we hire new employees. Uh, we have litigation. Surprise, surprise. It's California, there's litigation. That's not even newsworthy, right? <laughs> Nothing happens in California that's important to without litigation. So we have litigation. We got sued by seven of our you know, public employee unions. That case got consolidated in Superior Court. We got a, a tentative decision that's almost final now, uh, upholding 12 of the 15 provisions and striking down three of the 15 provisions. So this is California. Remember, the law is sometimes strange. The judge says, that the vested rights doctrine prevents us from making our employees pay more towards their retirement benefits. But you can cut their pay in the same amount to, to go towards unfunded liabilities. So that's one of the things, uh, one of the reasons that, that we will uh, take the appeal. And we're also in administrative uh, litigation with California Public Employees Retirement Board many, many uh, complaints filed by our unions over the, uh, over the process as well. So we continue to do that, and, and that's why we spent $3 million uh, defending all of those, and we're still going. But we're also saving money this year. The employee choice provisions that we think are important, have, we've not been able to implement those yet because we're, we've asked for and waiting for a private letter ruling from the IRS. Uh, the IRS has not issued private letter rulings in this area for over six years. Uh, so we, we had to put together a national coalition of organizations, national organizations, to try to move the IRS off the dime. They put it on their work plan, it's in the work plan, uh, but they're uh, dragging their feet uh, to issue guidance in this area because uh, some of the national unions object to making it possible to give the employees a choice. Because if you give the employees a choice, they'll make a bad one. And that's their rationale. So we're struggling with that at the national level as well, but it's really important because under the California Vested Rights Doctrine, there's, there's very little you can do. But giving the employees a choice is something that allows the employee to make the choice. The constitutional protection for vested rights flows to the employee, belongs to the employee, so the employee can make that decision. So we think it's important, especially since there are very few other things that you can do in, in other cities. So we're working on that to try to make that happen. But the California rule on vested rights is in the way of doing anything significant in most cities in the state. There are two ways to change that. The first is to get a case in front of the California Supreme Court so they can tell us what, how they interpret some case that's over 50 years old that I think is being misinterpreted and others think as well. But you've got to put a case in front of the Supreme Court so they can do that. There are two cases. The San Jose case is headed that way, and I think the Contra Costa County case is going to be headed that way. Hopefully they'll both arrive up there about the same time. And it will give the California Supreme Court an opportunity to straighten out the law, clarify the law, however you want to call it. They're the ones who can do it because uh, the, the lower courts, and our trial court judge, of course, is constrained by precedent. 
So we're in, endeavoring to put a case in front of the Supreme Court. That's a couple of years away. The other thing we can do is to amend the California Constitution. And uh, Stephanie and I, uh, Bill Camp, and uh, Pat Morris from San Bernardino has their own experience, and uh, Tom Tate from Anaheim have joined together to be proponents for the statewide ballot initiative. Now you notice in that there are four Democrats and one Republican, and, and we're all mayors, or vice mayors in the case of, of Stephanie. And we structured this thing around that for a couple of reasons. One is this needs to be led by Democrats. Democrats led us into this trouble, and Democrats need to lead us out of this trouble. This cannot be a fight of the Republicans against the unions, in my political estimation. Democrats need to lead. That's one thing. The second thing is mayors. I'm a mayor. I only really care about mayors, and you know, let the legislature solve their own problems. Mayors are important to me. And so mayors have come together because we're the ones who have to suffer the consequences. We're the ones that are cutting services in our low and moderate income neighborhoods in order to pay for expanding costs. We're the ones who have to deal with this. And each city knows how best to deal with this problem. So this is drafted from the perspective of mayors. First principle is we don't like the state of California telling us what to do. So the ballot initiative is empowering and not prescriptive of how Vallejo or San Jose or any other city will solve their problems. We need to give the mayors the power and the authority to do that. That's what we like. And then we figure it out for our city. That's what we do. We're problem solvers. But we have our hands tied behind our back in this area. We've got big problems that we're not allowed to deal with. So we're empowering mayors to do one thing, basically, which is to go to the bargaining table with the public employee unions and negotiate changes to future benefits in future contracts for future work yet to be performed. Now, that's not a radical idea. There's probably 18 states that already have that and can do that. But it's radical in California and the public employee unions do not want us to have the power to negotiate. And they do not want to have the voters to have the power to do something by initiative. But that's what this ballot measure does. It doesn't say what the retirement age ought to be. It doesn't say defined benefits are good, defined benefits are bad, or defined contribution. It doesn't say any of that. Because I know that among the thousands of jurisdictions in the state, there are gonna be many, many different solutions. And mayors want the power and the authority to do that and so we've drafted in that regard. The proponents, uh, we have five of us. It's not that easy to get out there publicly, uh, as Stephanie knows all too well, because there are plenty of people who don't want anything to happen and who uh, launch all kinds of attacks. Uh, but as I said earlier, doing nothing is worse than the, uh, the personal attacks and the political attacks of Continuing to do nothing is a, a road to disaster. We have to do something. So this ballot measure is that something. It changes the California Constitution. These the California rule of vested rights is not written in the California Constitution. It comes out of case law interpreting the California Constitution. So we're proposing to put something in the Constitution that says very clearly that local governments have the power to negotiate changes to future benefits and future contracts. Now that's not a total solution to the whole problem, but it's an enormous solution. And it's reasonably fair solution to a complex problem for which there is no perfect solution. And we know that the voters are supportive. We've seen it in San Jose, we've seen it in San Diego, we've seen it in Pacific Grove. If you're being fair and reasonable, the voters will support pension reform. And so we're very reasonable, very fair, the voters understand there's a problem, and the voters will respond positively. But it's not easy to get it in front of the voters. There's a big fight for that, as is there on everything else that we do. Uh, that's the initiative. The status of the initiative. Well, you probably read in the news uh, last week or so that the uh, Superior Court declined our request to make the Attorney General change the language in the title and summary. So we submit the initiative, submit the initiative, the Attorney General does a hundred word summary of the initiative, which is what the people who signed petitions would sign and ultimately would make its way into the voter pamphlet. Well, that hundred word summary that the Attorney General did was inaccurate and misleading. So we didn't think we should allow it to stand without a fight, so we filed an action in the Superior Court. Unfortunately, the judge said, well, we have to give great deference to the Attorney General and 
if you want, you know, change that, you need to take it up with the Court of Appeal because I'm a trial court judge and those are the cases. So we're thinking about taking the appeal. We'll assess that. Uh, but it's clear that we don't have time to make it to the 2014 uh, ballot because we have to turn in the signatures, 807,000 of them, uh, about the middle of April. According to the Secretary of State, that's when you need to turn them in if you want to be assured of making the 2014 ballot. We don't have time to do that. So we have a little more time uh, to step back. Uh, we will uh, resubmit in some cycle for the 2016, whenever is the best time to collect signatures. Uh, we'll think about what's in the measure. We might retool it a bit, uh, but we're going to poll on it, poll the language that the Attorney General put out. What lawyers argue about words, but really what matters is what the voters think about the words. So we're going to do some polling and uh, rethink it, but we're going to press ahead for 2016 uh, because the problem is not going away. It's only getting worse, and 2016 will be a good year to have it on the ballot, just as 2014 was a good year to have it on the ballot because the voters will support reasonable pension reform. We've proved that over and over again uh, at the local level, and the, the polling that I've seen and we've done around the state shows that if you're, if you're reasonable and fair, the voters will support it. So with that, I want to thank you. This organization, organizations like yours are absolutely critical at pushing this issue onto the public uh, stage because elected officials have a tremendous incentive to not talk about it. And uh, it is the taxpayers ultimately who need to be the ones to make people talk about it. Because if I could just talk about the political strategy on the other side, uh, not that the unions confided me or anything, but I've shared the dais with them. I've read every, lots of things they've written. I've been in negotiations with them. The strategy is, it's not our fault, you have the money, raise taxes. Now, so if you want to do nothing and just accept the tax increases, well, that, that's a way to deal with it, but it's going to be enormous tax increases. And so action is what is required, and it is the taxpayers that who need to stand up for their, for their rights and make the elected officials deal with it, find out how much you owe, how you're going to pay it, what's going to take and begin the process of trying to sort that out. So thank you for inviting me in here today. I think we have some time for questions. Okay, I'll take the questions. I don't promise to answer them, Is it, uh, but I'll try. The Attorney General Kamala Harris, I think, is that her name? Yes, the Attorney she General. She wrote an inaccurate ballot summary. You know, obviously, the first step would be to point that out to her. What was that reaction? How do you end up in court on that so quickly? Well, you end up in court over a title and summary because that's the only remedy, uh, the way it's structured. So as soon as the Attorney General says, here's the official title and summary, the clock starts ticking on your time period for collecting signatures. And there is no provision for having a discussion. We had the discussion before they wrote the title and summary. We did go in. I met with uh, not the Attorney General, but her staff that does this work, went through the ballot measure, answered their questions. But the remedy is to get it ripped from the Superior Court, so that's what we did. But it takes time to do that, and uh, we burned up the, the clock a little bit in the back. Um, what, what kind of allies could, do you think you could reach out to in going forward? Uh, you know, I'm always curious about deputies like the California League of Cities and what their position on this is because you would think that they would have a vested interest in cities, uh, but yet I think they don't take a position on this. Can you comment on that? I was in uh, Sacramento yesterday, as a matter of fact, and I did meet with Chris McKenzie, the CEO of, of uh, California League of Cities. So it, it, the League of Cities is a collection of members of cities. Cities are represented by elected officials. So those elected officials tend to reflect a wide range of interests on this issue from those who want to do something about it, trying to do something about it, to those who are afraid to ask the question, to those who don't want to do anything for whatever reason, often political reasons. So elected officials are reluctant to publicly talk about this. You know, Stephanie and I have talked to other mayors and other council people who support what we're doing but aren't in a position where they can say something about it. So the League of Cities is a reflection of its membership. Uh, they are doing some substantive things on it that I think are important. Uh, they're working on a tool to uh, enable cities to figure out how bad their problem is. And which is important because in smaller cities with uh, you know, less staff and less resources, it's awfully hard to figure out the answer. 
And there's plenty of people who are trying to keep you from figuring out the answer. I mean, you got to go ask CalPERS for information. You know, they're not necessarily the most helpful people in the state. So the League of Cities um, is a work in progress, uh, I, I guess is, is best to say. But it's not clear where the members of the League are. And so that re is reflected in the fact they haven't engaged in this. And uh, they had decided that they would wait until it qualified for the ballot before they would do the analysis and take a position. Also in the back. What is the IRS decision that you're waiting on? It's been, I think, five or six years and they haven't issued some opinion? Yeah, the IRS, uh, the problem with the IRS is when you have a, you know, a tax treatment of a retirement benefit, everybody wants to have, uh, you know, pre-tax contributions, that if you give somebody a choice, the implication is they have control over the money. And when they have control over the money, that it can be a taxable event. And that choice question creates the, the, the issue. And so we asked for a private letter ruling says, if we give them choice in this fashion, that we don't think it creates a taxable event, do you agree? And they refuse to answer the question. And we are one of at least two dozen jurisdictions that I know of that have requests informally to IRS to do private letter rulings. Now, you don't need their permission. It's just whether or not they agree with your interpretation of the tax code. So there are jurisdictions that have moved ahead and have done that without asking for permission, because you don't have to ask. California had a choice provision uh, a, a couple of decades ago. And it's not an unusual tool. It's just that in 2006, the IRS was worried about some abuses uh, some cheating, and so they issued some some guidance, some reg a regulation to kill the cheating, which they did. Uh, but they also killed a lot of other things, and we need to clarify that. And that's what the guidance is are supposedly working on. You, have, you definitely have the momentum on your side. So why is something not being on the ballot for November 2014? Well, we just ran out of time. We'd have to collect 800,000 signatures in the next month, and uh, that's not feasible. Uh, but 2016, the momentum, the momentum's not going away. Uh, and, you know, we did quite a bit of analysis of, well, what is a better time, 2014, 2016? And there, there are many good arguments in favor of 2016 being the best year to do that. And part of the, the political environment, if you look at what happened in San Jose and why we were able to be successful, is I've been working on this issue for years. And we had an enormous amount of local media coverage of the issue and the facts. And we had really good data and really good professional work demonstrating the scope of the problem and how we got into the problem. And all of that was the base on which we then ran a political campaign. And so when we ran the political campaign, the issues that the, the public employee unions tried to use against us, many of them were boomerang issues. Because they would say one thing, it would make people think about another, and it would come back to hurt them. That's the boomerang effect. So because we had all of this you know, free media coverage, we had a well-educated populace, and we had the data. And so between now and 2016, I think there's going to be tremendous coverage of all of the increases in all of the cities across the state, as well as the Calsters fight that's going to go on, in, uh, hopefully, in public of how to solve that. So 2016, in, in some ways, could be better than 2014. Uh, but really, we don't have a choice. We just, you know, the clock ran out on us. Wondering, uh, looking at San Jose going back maybe 10 years ago, could a citizen of San Jose gone down to the city hall, got the budget, and looked at a line item um, on the budget, maybe during 2004, 2005, 2006, and seen some exponential trend that would have said, hey, warning, warning, no, I don't think you could uh, could get that out of our, our budgets in, in those years. And, uh, you know, it's not always clear in the light items where the money is going. So, for example, the police department, right? The police department budget went up. But if you go to the police department budget, you know, it's awfully hard to figure out, well, retirement cost is a huge part of that. Uh, but we've started aggregating it, we're reporting on it, we've got financial reports from the boards, and, and so we, we've made a, a, a project out of making sure that we're well informed and the public is well informed. But that is not the case, you know, if you go pick up a budget, even if you pick up the 
comprehensive annual financial report. So it won't necessarily tell you the answer. Somebody, in our case, our city auditor, uh, went through, aggregated it, gave us a history, showed us all the increases, showed us what percentage of our costs are attributable to the bad decisions of the past. Uh, extremely important to educating the public. And that's a role that has to be played really by third parties in some fashion. It can't be played by mayors because we start out with the, the charge that this is an imaginary problem. You are making it up. You are exaggerating. That's exactly where my largest union, my AFSCME union, uh, started. There's an op-ed piece ran in Mercury News. This is an imaginary problem. I think they finally come off of imaginary, but they're still in its exaggeration. But so you have to have third parties. And Joe Nation, I think Stephanie mentioned Joe Nation at Stanford is doing some good work. Uh, but you need third parties to come in and validate the numbers so that you have a baseline on which the public can trust the numbers and you don't have to argue about the numbers. So when I talk about CalPERS, I use CalPERS as numbers. You could argue that numbers are a lot worse than they are, but I don't have to get into that argument. It's bad enough, even in the optimistic scenario. So I don't really argue about discount rates and rates of return. It doesn't matter. The optimistic scenario is horrible. <laughs> in the back. I mean, go to solving your financial problems the easy way. Pull up Barack Obama and ask for a bailout. <laughs> Well, there are certainly people who believe that the federal government is going to bail out the states, and uh, that is, in fact, uh, a request that has been made by some states and some cities like Chicago. Uh, I personally don't believe the federal government is going to uh, bail us out. Uh, I wouldn't ask for the money. I think we need to deal with our own problems and solve them our own ways. But, you know, it is tempting to go to people who have printing presses and ask them to print up another bundle. Uh, the good thing is that local government, we don't have printing presses. We have to balance the budget with real money, affecting real people, cutting real services. And so we're close to the public, and, and on this issue, that's really helpful because the key thing in, in reform is being able to demonstrate the connection between those services that people want and the costs which are making you cut the services. And there's many ways to hide that relationship. At the local level, it's really hard to hide it. And so that gives us a an edge and a reason and a compulsion uh, to deal with a problem that doesn't exist at the, at the state and the federal level. But I don't think the feds are going to bail us out. Yeah, thanks for your uh, efforts and for being here for us tonight for today. Um, with the 2016 and the way of getting it across to the voters, since private enterprise, most people are lucky to get out with two thirds of their pay in retirement and they pay for a big chunk of that. In the military, 30 years service and any additional that, if you live through it, it's 30, it's the third, 30 percent of your pay is what your uh, retirement is. I wonder if a statewide initiative the public could pass that might be simple for everyone to understand is something along the lines that no public employee, uh, past, present, or future, uh, whatever package of their pension is, should be more than 70 percent of their highest earning year or their last or highest earning year. And then that would be something simple everyone can understand. Hey, 70% is peaked out. Because it really gripes everybody, that, that, uh, except the, the receiver, uh, that someone's making more in retirement than they were when they were working for the public and, and giving them some service. So I wonder if something simple like that could be something. And then it could be like the ones that got earlier if they go with earlier being, I'd ramp it down on the same ballot initiative over five years. So whatever their pay was over five years, it gets ramped back to that. That gives them time to sell their beach house and the rest of it and adjust their, uh, uh, their income. Well, that is a relatively simple to explain solution. And as we developed our, our ballot measure, we went through analysis thinking about all of those that and many other kinds of uh, solutions. Uh, so there's two problems with that and why we didn't go there. Uh, one is you can't do that for current employees. I'm sorry, California Rural Investor Rights, you can't do that. So if you wanted to do that, you would need our initiative first to empower you to do some things. And even our initiative wouldn't allow you to go back and take away what people have already earned. Because that's a principle of our initiative. You keep what you've earned. Uh, the future is negotiable. So then the other part of it is uh, in, in terms of politics, this has to be something that appeals to Republicans, Democrats, Independents, you name it, has to appeal across the board. And while that has an, an appeal to some people, I don't think it's a one of those broad things that would 
would appeal across the board. Uh, you know, I haven't haven't polled on that. I do know there's been polling at, at putting a cap, a, a dollar cap on it, even simpler concept, right? Okay, no more than hundred thousand dollars. I know that's been polled. It, it's very favorable, uh, but it doesn't solve the problem that I'm that I'm facing. So, you know, our initiative is designed to solve the problems that we're facing to give us the power to solve the problems. So that's why we didn't go there. Yeah, this is kind of a follow on what he suggested, but in, in, in favor of the federal government, they tackled this problem back in the 80s. That's when they shifted to the 1% a year, and then they, they put in a plan that was similar to our 401k. And that way people have skin in the game, just like your plan, where you want the employees to share the risk 50-50. So I'm wondering, why has it taken state and local level so long to do what the federal government that normally works at a geologic pace did in the 1980s? I was speaking at the Brookings Institute a couple of weeks ago in Washington, D.C. On, on pension reform, and they thought it highly amusing being in Washington that somehow the federal government would be a model for how to solve our problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is kind of funny, right? But if I was sort of starting from scratch. What the federal government did is, I think, a, a very good way to deal with it. But the federal government wasn't constrained by the California rule on vested rights. They have a different set of, uh, of constraints. But that combination of Social Security, a modest defined benefit, and a defined contribution plan is a model that can work. As long as you control those liabilities on that defined benefit plan, because you know you can run into trouble even in a modest plan uh, if you don't fund it properly and don't pay the annual required contribution annually and things like that. But the federal plan is is not bad. If you look at all the models around the country, the federal plan is one of the one of the best. And that was surprising to the people in Washington. <laughs> A lot of us are very fond of Councilman Pete Constant, who, like you, is also term limited and not running for mayor. What's the future San Jose? Who could step up and follow in your footsteps? Uh, Pete is not running for mayor. Uh, Pete was one of my uh, staunch allies on this. He knows a lot more about it than I do. And he was uh, you know, just central to it. Now, I can say that for 100% certainty, because most of our tough decisions were on a 6-5 vote. Uh, Pete was the lone Republican on the city council. He was one of my six, so I couldn't have done it without Pete. That's absolutely true. Uh, for the future of San Jose, well, we have uh, a mayor's race underway, and uh, half of the council seats are, are being contested. Uh, the public employee unions have a candidate in the race. I have four of my council colleagues. Pete's the only one who was part of my, uh, my six-person majority that's not running. And uh, so I have four of them that are running. Uh, that have paid the price, have been attacked, and have withstood the attacks, and have proved that they can stand up for the special interests and do what's right for the people. So I haven't endorsed anybody. They all have earned my endorsement. Uh, but, uh, you know, I still got to get the six votes every Tuesday. And so I'm not going to endorse in the, in the primary. We'll see what happens in, in the runoff. But if the public union's candidate wins the mayor's race, things would shift. There's no doubt about that because there's you know, the appeal that we're on still has to be funded and you still have to be willing to to take on the fight so if they get their candidates selected if they take control of the city council they could abandon the appeal so there's still risk here but uh, we do have good people running there's no doubt that we're really good people running and i'm hopeful that they're going to win um well i have a comment first I think I was happy to see that you didn't make the 2014. Um, I wanted 2016 because you know, with the accounting standard rules changing on July 1st of 2015, which I'm really looking forward to that day, we'll find out when you know the unfunded liabilities have to be reflected in the financial statements of the municipality. And I can see municipalities all across the nation uh, appearing insolvent. At least you know it's it's kind of real. They, they can't. It's not the sort of off balance, off book kind of item, the unfunded liability, but it seems real when you, it will be reflected on the financial statement. So I think that's good in terms of building momentum for your cause. But I did read the Wall Street Journal article last week, and um, I thought the quote from the union representative was disturbing, basically saying your initiative is unnecessary because the economy is growing. And I was 
wondering uh, what you think of that comment. Well, unnecessary is what they usually describe by initiative because they claim that, well, we can already bargain over this stuff. Well, you can bargain over it, but you can't bargain over substantive changes. Uh, you can bargain. You just you don't get anything that changes substantively because the California Rule of Investor Rights prohibits the unions from bargaining <coughs> on the issue. Now, if you want to give them something in exchange for something, they can do that. So if you want them to pay 2% more and you give them a 2% pay raise, they can bargain there. So there is some bargaining, but it's not bargaining sufficient to deal with the problem. So unnecessary because the economy is getting good. What's the CalPERS unfunded liability and which direction is it going? What's the CalSTRS unfunded liability and which direction is it going? They had a great return the last year. They probably need, at a minimum, 10 years of double digit investment returns to where, to where you would be in a point where you say, okay, we're making progress. It's not, not going to go away with investment returns. CalPERS hasn't even recognized all the losses from 2008, 2009. And, you know, there's a smoothing period and a phasing period and a step up period and then an amortization period. And then there's the delay period when they don't want to do anything. So they've really futured this stuff out. And that's really one of the differences between the San Jose plan and, and, and CalPERS is the amortization periods and the smoothing periods. But you know, there's so many ways to push the problem off, and it's so tempting. And trust me, it is very tempting to elect an official to push it off. And if we had another choice in San Jose, it would have been hard to sell. But we were facing service delivery insolvency, and as noted by the judge in Detroit, the judge in San Bernardino, uh, service delivery insolvency is basically what happens when you have enough money to pay your bills, you just can't provide services to your people. And uh, so we didn't want to go there because we knew the next step was bankruptcy. And so that's why we took on the issue. And I think other cities are going to find themselves in the same place. What I'd like to do is give them the tools to avoid bankruptcy, the tools to deal with the problem some way other than bankruptcy. And that's what we're trying to do at the statewide level. Thank you for having me on here today. Thank you. Thank you, San Jose Mayor Chuck for coming to us in this difficult situation of pension reform. I want to remind everyone, um, if you're a board of directors,